Okay, so I'm between you and lunch, so we'll try to make this short. Uh, those who, who were here last year, uh, I talked a bit about work we were doing with Drude oscillators. I'll do a little bit of review of that and then talk about some of the more recent work uh, that we've done with these. And so, Cyrus, there's no quantum money Kawa here, and we, a lot of this we didn't even need the computer, uh, David. So uh, just to uh, summarize some of the things we've done over the years, uh, where we've used these Drude oscillators, and if I don't run out of time, I'll mention briefly work we've done in using this to model the dynamical response of electrons in water to an excess electron. Uh, We'll talk about treating dispersion interactions between atoms and molecules using crude oscillators. And we'll make a connection to uh, polarization potentials. Uh, Togo and Kay, the two, uh, in blue are two of the students who are working on this now, and the other names in black are people who worked on this in the past. So a little, a little bit of uh, history. There's a picture of Paul Drude. Uh, who introduced the, the oscillator into the literature in 1902. It's an incredibly simple model. It's just two charges, fictitious charges, a plus and a minus, coupled harmonically. So it's a Bachman envelope calculation that if you put this system in a, an electric field, the polarizability is Q squared over K. So K is the force constant, Q is the fictitious charge. This is for a spherical oscillator. You can obviously make it non-spherical and have three different kx, ky, kz uh, force constants. So this is the result if you treat the oscillator classically. You, and very large number of force fields have appeared in recent years uh, using Drude oscillators to describe polarizability. We're particularly interested in them using them, treating them quantum mechanically which will allow one to recover uh, dispersion interactions. OK, so uh, obviously, this is a type of coarse graining. In fact, all force fields are coarse graining. It's, uh, but with the Drude oscillators, you can treat both the polarization, which is a classical effect, and the dispersion interactions, which is a quantum mechanical effect. And the key parameters I've already mentioned the there's going to be a frequency of the oscillator, a force constant, the mass, and the fictitious charge. So you can find this in many textbooks, but let me just remind you, if you have two coupled Drude oscillators, uh, it's a change of variables uh, to find the exact dispersion energy for the system. So you introduce these new variables that in involve x1 plus x2, x1 minus x2, and you get the frequencies for the interacting system. So this immediately conveys the idea that the interaction energy is caused by the change of the zero point energy. So you have two non-interacting oscillators that would have the zero point energy, which is given by omega. You allow them to interact, uh, you'll get a change in the zero point energy. And if you just do a Taylor series, so there's your final result. If you do a Taylor series of that, the leading term goes like the polarizability squared omega r to the six. That's just the London expression for the dispersion interaction between uh, uh, two atoms. So I'm not going to go in this detail because I talked about this part uh, last year. You can pretend you don't know the solution to this and use standard quantum chemistry methods. So you can introduce a basis set, which are going to be the harmonic oscillator functions. You can do configuration interaction, RPA, uh, coupled cluster. Uh, or any of the, uh, your other favorite uh, methods. And let me just point out sort of an interesting thing. This problem, which you can solve back at the envelope, if you set this up with a basis set, it turns out to be an infinite matrix of this type here. And I, I've searched the literature extensively to find if anyone knows the transformation of this back to a simple analytical expression and have not been able to find that. Oh, there shouldn't be an asymmetry. If there, I thought I'd got, oh, that's a typo if there is. OK, so now for uh, something that had attracted our interest for a while, and it's actually attracted the interest in a lot of people who are thinking about corrections of density functional theory for dispersion. So if you go back to Feynman's classic 1939 paper, 
often cited as uh, the Hellman Feynman, although Hellman is not a co-author of this. In the very last paragraph, he makes two very, very interesting observations. Uh, one is he points out that if you had two atoms at long distance, due to the dispersion interaction, each atom would get a permanent dipole, and the negative ends of the dipoles would be pointing towards one another. So if you think about the traditional explanation of dispersion, we have a fluctuating fluctuation generating a dipole and instantaneously it generates another dipole. There would be no permanent dipoles coming from that because you could generate the dipole pointing in either direction. In addition, what Feynman said is if you knew the change in the charge distribution, you can classically calculate your dispersion energy. There's not a single line of proof here. This is based on his undergraduate uh, thesis. Uh, so he certainly wasn't famous yet, but uh, it's hard to believe that these two statements appeared there with no proof whatsoever. Uh, we have obtained his undergraduate thesis, and it's, it's hard for us to see how he figured this out, uh, especially in light of the way the uh, proof was done uh, later on. Uh, I think it was, I mean, it was proven numerically by Hirschfeld and Eliasson in 1967. That didn't really provide a physical model, it just numerically showed it worked. It was, he, they took two hydrogen atoms at very long distance and did a very big electronic structure calculation. Uh, the real proof of how this works was provided by Kathy Hunt in a very, really, at least to us, complicated paper involving non-linear response. But essentially what happens is there's a fluctuation on one atom that it introduces a dipole. That couples with the dipole, dipole, quadrupole, hyperpolarizability of the other atom. This is the nonlinear aspect. That's what generates the permanent dipole on the other atom. Not a single mention of this in, in Feynman's uh, thesis. Uh, and there's related work by several other uh, groups. So, if you go back to this Drude oscillator problem, in the treatment I gave you a moment ago where I gave the exact expression for dispersion, we allowed only for dipole-dipole coupling. So it's an x1, x2 over r cubed coupling. If that's all you had, you would not pick up the permanent dipole. So this statement that Feynman made does not actually work for all Hamiltonians. To get this to work for this model, uh, you have to introduce the dipole-quadrupole term. So your Hamiltonian now has dipole-dipole coupling plus the two possible dipole-quadrupole terms. Then you will pick up the Feynman uh, effect. Given this Hamiltonian, you can treat it using perturbation theory, which we have done, or you can treat it with a response type treatment uh, analogous to what uh, Hunt has done. The beauty is all the integrals involved in treating this, you can work out analytically. So it's a Nice exam question, maybe, for advanced level uh, graduate course. So here's the wave function. We've worked out the wave function. These terms here turn out to be zero. But this is both oscillators in the ground state. If a one, the 1-1 one, one means both oscillators are excited from the 0 to 1. So that's your dipole allowed transition of each of the oscillators. Uh, but you also couple in, because of the quadrupole terms, you couple in excitations. Here's one oscillator is in the x level, the other one is, let's say, in the x squared level, okay? So you need to allow for the ground state and the first two excited states of uh, the Drude oscillators. And given this wave function, you can then just take the expectation value of the dipole operator and work out what the permanent dipole moment is. If you work that out, you get the following result here, uh, which you would also get from doing a response treatment that the dipole on atom two is the polarizability on atom one, that's where the initial fluctuation occurs, times the ZZZ component of the dipole, dipole, quadrupole, hyperpolarizability. So there's your expression for the dipole. It goes as one over out of the seventh, which is exactly what Feynman had uh, indicated. <coughs> And this is just the response treatment of the same quantity right here. So you, just like the casimir polder expression where you'd be doing an integral over the imaginary frequencies of the two dipole polarizabilities, 
Here you have the dipole and the dipole, dipole, quadrupole hyperpolarizability. Now I should point out if all components of B actually enter into this, but if the two atoms are spherical, there's relationships between the different components, so you only have to do a single integral in, in working this out. And the other thing I should point out that maybe is surprising the very, very first time you see it, if, if here are the two atoms along the z-axis, a fluctuation of the dipole in the x contributes to the permanent dipole on the z-axis on the other atom. Okay, so one has worked this out, one gets the uh, same result from the two approaches. We know the change of the Chads distribution. If we apply the Hellman-Feynman theorem to that, we can derive C6, and it's exactly the same result that one gets the, from the second order perturbation theory that I showed you uh, a moment ago. Uh-oh, are you saying three minutes? Okay, here's a picture of the charge distribution of the non-interacting atoms. Now they're interacting, they look essentially identical. You take the difference and there's the two negative ends pointing in exactly as Feynman uh, had predicted. Now how big are these uh, dipoles? So if you took uh, two argon atoms, I'm going one angstrom beyond overlap because I want to really minimize overlap effects. And you work it out, the dipole on each atom would only be 10 to minus four divided, which is really pretty tiny, but if you take a highly polarizable atom like calcium, it turns out to be about a tenth of a Dubai. If you go into the Linder paper, he worked out the analogous problem that if you have an atom above a surface, what's the dipole that, uh, permanent dipole that would result on the atom to the effect? In that case, instead of going as one over r to the seventh, it's going as one over, well, in um, z to the fourth. And again, it involves the uh, dipole, dipole, quadrupole, hyperpolarizability of the atom. And now you can see this can actually become uh, sizable. This is a function of the frequencies in the problem, and if you have a metal versus an insulator, obviously different frequencies go uh, into that. So we're, we're about out, is that correct? Of time? Well, oh. I, I, it's, there's six minutes left, including questions. Okay, six minutes left. Then I'll just mention Okay, uh, let me change, show you two, th two things and we'll get into questions. We originally got interested in these Drude oscillators for modeling the response of uh, electrons and molecules. And so we set up a model where an electron interacting with a bunch of waters, the, the interaction would be called, treated by Drude oscillators. And again, we're treating this quantum mechanically because if you have a very, very diffuse electron and a bunch of waters, there's a dispersion interaction between that diffuse electron and the water. So the Drude oscillators are being treated quantum mechanically. This is a water six cluster. This is showing what the electron would be distributed if there was only the electrostatics in the problem. When you turn the Drude oscillators on to put the dispersion, you can see there's just a huge contraction of the charge distribution. And I think I'll just end with something that we're very interested in. I, I took this from a, a paper from Chichenko. This is showing the uh, Van der Waals coefficient per carbon atom for a bunch of carbon materials. So, and it's showing that as a function of system size. So here's your full range down here. So C20, so the total Van der Waals coefficient would be 20 times this. You can see how this is changing. Up here is graphene, just fundamentally different. And this is different multiple layers of graphene, and you can see that's changing. All of this is calculated, all these dispersion interactions are calculated here by interacting root oscillators, allowing for many body effects. Uh, what's interesting is if you look at force fields, uh, which are used in simulations by chemists, they would be using essentially the same C6 coefficient for all materials. And they would be leaving out things such as screening. And you would see that's uh, gonna be drastically wrong. So we're very, very interested in extending the things we've been doing to these problems. So stop at that point. Thank everyone for their attention.